at least a partial view of what this fantastic metaphysical construct is. And if you want to incidentally explore it further, the, uh, alas, the literature is not too well available, but there is an excellent account of it in the second volume of Feng Yulan's History of Chinese Philosophy. And I think that's the best place to go. There is a book, that, a little book that Suzuki wrote called The Essence of Buddhism, published in London by the Buddhist Society. And that also is an account of it. But it's harder to find. So now, how do we get from where we were to Zen? <clears throat> well, it goes like this. In the Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch, the Tanjing, which was the collected teachings of the Sixth Patriarch of the Zen School, who, as I said, was a contemporary of Fatsang, and uh, Fatsang died in 712 AD, and Huineng died in 713. In his discourse, he gives a lesson on the art of teaching, the art of being a guru. And this lesson is based on getting people to be capable of polar thinking. Polar thinking is simply, oh well, it's not just thinking, it's a kind of feeling and a kind of sensing, wherein you see the going togetherness of things that have thought to be mutual, are thought to be mutually exclusive opposites. In other words, you wouldn't know you were right if, unless somebody else was wrong. Normally, we think then the right and the wrong are mutually exclusive. But when you are capable of polar thinking, you see that they go together. A, po a person who feels in a polar way sees figure and background going together. He doesn't see them as mutually exclusive. Now then, you see, when I was explaining the Gigi Muge, the fourth Dharma world, or the fourth way of looking at the universe, which is the culmination of the Kegon school, I was trying to show this point, that all, all events have a go-withness with each other in the same way as a figure in a background. So in order to get this point across, Hui Nang explained that when a person asks you a question about something sacred, you give him an answer in terms of something secular. When he asks you about something eternal, you give him an answer in terms of the temporal. When he asks you about something abstract, you give him an answer in terms of the concrete. And so the whole way down the line. So when you read your Zen stories, which are always this apparently delightful nonsense, Somebody says, what is the fundamental meaning of Buddhism? And the answer is, a dried dung scraper. In uh, Far East, they, don't use, they used not to use toilet paper. They had a stick they used instead. And uh, this is the answer. <laughs> You see, he has switched completely from the domain of life that is considered philosophical and sacred to one that is considered completely profane and unmentionable. Then on other occasions, it's, it goes the other way. A monk says to the master, and they're engaged in uh, cooking, they're peeling potatoes or something, and he says, pass me the knife. The master hands it to him, blade first. And the monk says, please give me the other end. 
The master says, what would you do with the other end? And this immediately has a kind of metaphysical flavor to it. So that he jumps, you see, from the practical question to the metaphysical. But if you ask him the metaphysical, he will always answer in terms of the everyday. And the whole genius of Zen is really this, that uh, it has got a way of religious life and a form of iconography, the form of which is secular. And it has uh, created a whole school of poetry where the m deep philosophical matters are never, never mentioned. Except sometimes by way of making a joke. Because what Zen tries to do ideally is to be completely cool. to create the religion of no religion so that you don't notice it's around unless you're in the know. <clears throat> now this is not actually true in practice. Many people are disturbed when they go to Japan and they walk into Zen temples and find that they have rituals and services such as I've just been playing to you that they have elaborate Buddha images and people are making bows to them. As a matter of fact, when Professor Houston Smith went to Japan and uh, was being shown round a Zen monastery, he noticed that his guide, the, the particular master of the monastery, whenever he passed an image of the Buddha would stop and bow. And he said to him, I don't understand this, he said, because I thought you Zen Buddhists uh, would burn up these images, and uh, as you, one of your masters did in one of the stories, said, I don't see why you bow, you might just as well spit at them. The master said, you spits, I bows. But you see, the, the, the thing about all this is, the, about iconoclasm, there are very different spirits of iconoclasm. The Puritan iconoclasts, who broke down all the images in the English churches, hated the images. They thought they were evil and wrong, and so they smashed them ruthlessly. But when a chicken comes out of the eggshell, the eggshell is not something to be deplored. It's certainly something to be broken. But had the shell not existed, the chicken wouldn't have been protected. So in precisely the same way, images, religious ideas, religious symbols exist in order to be constructively and lovingly broken because they are like opening a package. If there's no package, you know, you can hardly get the contents, because they'd fall all through your fingers. So, if something comes to you in a package, that's why packaging is so important and so interesting. Something comes to you in a package. Well, it's like on Christmas Day, here are all these gorgeous packages with colors and gold and everything, and very often the packages are much better than what's in them. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You then, or everybody, proceeds to tear them apart and get what's inside. So, from this point of view, the Zen Buddhists regard all ideas about Buddhism, about philosophy, about religion, and so on, as so much packaging. And in order to get at it, you have to get rid of the packaging. So, what happens then? <coughs> When we get to the state I was talking about this morning, where you abandon completely all belief, you abandon every sort of way 
of hanging on to life. You accept your complete impermanence, the prospect of your death, of vanishing into nothing whatsoever, you see, and of uh, n not being able to control anything, of being at the mercy of what is completely other than you. And you let go to that, you see. In, in this means that you even get rid of any, any God whatsoever to do this fully. You don't have a thing left to cling to. So this complete let go flips. And you discover, having made it, a new way of experiencing altogether in which You don't need any God because you're it. But also, you don't cling to the idea that you're it. In other words, this is why Krishnamurti uh, makes a certain kind of attack on people who are Vedantists and who believe that the human self is ultimately the divine self. He says, why do you believe in that? See, because if you believe in it, you are making it a thing to, to hang on to. And so, in a way then, you see, all belief in God is lack of faith. Has that ever struck you? You're still clinging. And so long as you're still clinging, you don't have faith, because faith is the state of total let go. So, when through some marvelous desperation, we get to the state of total let go. Uh, and then, you see, uh, fantastically, religion, uh, anything like religion, simply disappears. There's no need for it any longer. It's like you've crossed the shore, uh, crossed to the other shore, you don't need the raft. Get off. Leave the raft behind. Now, the other shore is actually the same as this one. You know, when you cross the river, when the mountain is in the distance, see, there's the other shore over there. It's kind of different from here. You can sit here and say, hmm, be nice to live there, wouldn't it? See a place up there, I just love to live because it looks so good from here. But then you go and you buy that house and you sit there and it feels the same as this place feels. Because you're there, and how things feel are how you are. And you look back across here and say, gee, doesn't that look lovely? <laughs> there are mysterious trails going up Mount Tamalpais that look as if they led to that place that we were talking about this morning, the secret garden which every child remembers. And they disappear through trees. And there's a kind of a mysterious little canyon when you can hear the sound of a waterfall and you know somewhere in there is that garden. I, I know, as a matter of fact, where it is. There is one. But always when you follow the road right through, it leads back to San Rafael and its suburbs on the other side, you see. <laughs> I have been years seeking the ideal place. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that it, the only way I can possibly find it is to be it. Uh, if you can find it in you, then anywhere you go is the ideal place to live. But it's so fascinating, projecting it outside and going on a look for it. I mean, this is the whole of fun. That's what fun means. 
So, when therefore religion is abandoned, you are in a dangerous fix because you can very easily slip into madness. We were talking this morning about a vision. Uh, Lloyd brought up this question about the vision of a fourth dimension or another dimension, and anybody who looked at it went crazy. And this is a real danger, that people who have the mystical vision, whether through practicing yoga or Zen Buddhism, or hesychast Christian prayers, or by taking LSD, become a serious menace to society. And society gets really worried about them because they have, they, they're not taking the world and its concerns seriously any longer. They know it's an illusion. And if you really know it's an illusion, if you really know I'm an illusion, I don't know what you're going to do with me. I don't know whether I trust you. I don't know whether you're going to keep the rules. I, I just don't know about you. You've seen through it, and goodness only knows. You may do anything. And if you're not sure of yourself, and you suddenly see that all this is an illusion, there's nothing you can cling to, it's all relative, uh, you may get bugged, and you may go nuts. That's the great danger in all of this. And that is why a Zen monastery is at one and the same moment a place of total iconoclasm, of seeing through the whole thing, and yet at the same time it maintains a discipline as clean and strict as any way you can find. The combination of the two is simply marvelous. Unfortunately, modern Japan doesn't dig it. But you, you, what they've done is to, they, they've well recognized that you cannot go into outer space and come back to this world without strict controls. It's exactly the same way when you're skin diving. You go below a certain number of fathoms and you experience weightlessness. Now a person who's not properly trained at that level will get happy. Now, there's no reason why you shouldn't get happy, provided you keep your wits about you. Nothing matters at all when your weight vanishes, because after all, you don't matter anymore. You have no weight. Nothing is weighty. Nothing is important. And a person may at this point take off his oxygen mask and offer it to a fish. In which case, he'll drown. He'll never come back. And if he stays down too long, he enjoys this too much, his oxygen supply will run out, and he'll be lost. So he has a watch. And he knows, according to discipline, that at a certain time on this instrument, he's got to come up. It's like when you had too much to drink, and you're driving, You've got to watch your speedometer, drive by instruments. When you're in a difficult situation in an airplane and you've lost your sense of gravity, watch your instrument, don't trust your senses. You see? This is very important. In Buddhist imagery, there are guardians of the directions of the universe. And they are all in the figure of Chinese generals 
with clubs and swords and very fierce expressions. And they are always put at gates, you know, gates are north, south, east and west, and here are the guards. They guard the entrances. But what they really guard is the directions. Because it's absolutely important that we can agree on our time scale and on our north, south, east and west so that I can meet you. If we can't agree about that, we'll miss each other completely. We'll never meet. And if we can't meet, we can't have dinner together. If we can't have dinner together, we can't love each other. So, in the middle of nothingness, which is all this space here, see, which is nothing whatever, there are nevertheless directions. And think what a beautiful thing that is, you see, to set up directions in the middle of nothing. So for this reason, in the religion where anything goes, and anything is allowed, and no holes are barred, there is for that reason precisely a discipline and an order. Which is pretty strict. But the spirit of the strictness is different than the spirit of strictness in um, theistic religions. See, in Buddhism there's no boss. Ultimate reality is not conceived in the form of authority. Because from their point of view that's childish. You're your own boss, and you're responsible. If you want to be, be, belong to a, a society, uh, it's up to you if you want to conform. In other words, one of the interesting things is you can always cease to be a monk without dishonor. In the Christian church, you can't, because you make life vows to get in. You promise forever to be obedient, chaste, and poor. And this is, this is irrevocable, like Christian marriage. But in the Buddhist order, you can leave any time you want. And they say, all right, you do, you, you've got many other lives ahead of you in which you can be a monk all over again. And if you don't want to do it this round, you don't have to. And we're not, we're not mad at you. Just please, if you don't want to undergo this discipline, go somewhere else. And there's no dishonor about that at all. I have a friend in Los Angeles who runs a very fancy restaurant. He was a Buddhist monk for 10 days. <laughs> It was quite an experience, but uh, that's all right. Okay, you try it. And if you want to stay here, we're very happy to have you. If you don't want to, we just assume you weren't around. Because you're not deceiving us, you know. If you stay and you don't really want to, but feel you ought to, you're a nuisance. It's like a person who feels they ought to be unselfish and is therefore always making promises which they're never going to fulfill. It's much better to be frank and tell people what you honestly feel than pretend. So, uh, for this reason then, where there is no religion at all, because everybody's realized that the sky is the limit, there isn't any boss, there's nothing to kowtow to, because you're it. It follows that you become therefore responsible for creating an order. Instead of that, but you see, instead of submitting to the order, you create it.
Next, you find that you can, having got rid of religion completely, well now everything becomes religious. That is to say, uh, instead of having uh, some kind of hang-up on universals, on vast, abstract, huge, airy conceptions, you employ instead things that are very particular, very temporal, because of Gigi Muge. You remember the, the image that I used to illustrate Gigi Muge was the net of jewels, wherein every crystal reflects all the other crystals, every dewdrop on the spider's web reflects all the others. Okay, so then, I just happened to pick up this because it um, happened to be handy. I don't want you to think about fans and Orient and all that sort of thing. But um, with this, all Buddhism can be taught. All the universe, all sciences, all philosophy can be demonstrated with this. Because this is one of the jewels reflecting all the others. So when you pick up a link in a chain, all the other links come up with it. See? So with this. And um, if you ask me about what is um, the mystery of life, what is God, and I show you this fan, people look at you in a strange way and say, um, I wonder what he meant by that. Well, the truth of the matter is he didn't mean anything at all. Because this doesn't mean anything. Uh, words mean something because they refer to events and things that are other than the sounds of the words. But the things and events that words refer to don't refer to anything else. Of course, they are connected with everything else, but they don't refer to everything else in the same way as a symbol does. So that's why uh, Zen always answers in terms of the completely concrete. What is this? Or well, fan happens to be a noise, which this isn't. This is what this is. Or alternatively, if you don't want to be hung up on it, it's this. <laughs> or this. So, in just the same way, uh, let's consider the advance that Zen makes in the world of art, so the world of painting. I showed you a Tibetan painting this morning, which was extremely elaborate, where every tiny space was filled, and where all of it was obviously religious. It was quite clear that this painting was an icon. Now, Zen people don't like that kind of painting. I mean, it isn't that they have a real prejudice against it, but they don't usually have it around. Instead, they prefer a style of painting in which there's an enormous amount of untouched paper and where uh, a brush 
has very swiftly and deftly painted some bamboo sort of in one corner. Now, the way the bamboo is put on the paper alives all the rest of the paper because it turns it into a lake without drawing a single line. A master can put bamboo on a piece of paper and turn the rest of the paper into a lake. <coughs> Everybody can see the lake there, although nothing has happened. Uh, empty space. Or it might be uh, a whole mountain might be there, but covered in mist. Because, you see, he didn't <coughs> use the paper as mere paper. You often see around, uh, especially motels, uh, they have, um, you know, the kind of motel where you have flower prints over the bed. And there's a bunch of flowers taken out of an old book of etchings or something, you know, and put in a frame by some interior decorator. They know these things. There was a one, two, three, four, and the son of a row. And always, the bunch of flowers is put bang in the middle of the piece of paper. Now, you know what that does? That devitalizes all the rest of the paper. Because it means the background has become unimportant. And this is always done by people who don't understand polar thinking, who don't feel that figure and ground go together. But all Zen painting, where you get this extraordinary relationship of figure to background, is done by people who feel and think in a, and actually sense in a polar way. They see the space and the solid simultaneously. And that's why the Chinese place things in space the way they do. Even, you can't all see it from where you're sitting, a piece of calligraphy uh, contains in it an extremely important relationship between the characters and the space. Now, it would take me quite a while to go into all the details of that. But they have to be just the right size to accord with that space. There isn't only one way of doing it. There are several ways of putting the characters in a piece of paper that size. But in each way that you use, you take account of the space. You don't use the paper as mere neutral background. So when, uh, for example, uh, you, you will find so often that the Chinese painter takes his area, his rectangular area in which he's painting, and he will paint one corner. And for, say from the bottom left, he will strike up a bamboo stalk and flow leaves in the wind on it. And so leave the rest. This is a trick, you see, which uses and, as I said, vitalizes the whole of the rest of the area. And you don't do that simply by putting the figure plump in the center. So, uh, 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 the whole art which has been inspired by Zen is based on polar recognition of the identity of space and solid, solid and space. You see, one implies the other. But this is always so unexpected from the point of view of common sense. People, uh, in other words, think space is nothing. And that it has no power. And so for this very reason, 
uh, the architecture inspired by Zen is practically all of it playing with space. Zen emphasizes the luxurious richness of poverty. Of rooms with practically nothing in them. Furniturelessness. And it, it, it has a luxury that's unbelievable. The uncluttered life. Although, I must say, that somewhere, I went to the house of a very great tea master, where everything was absolutely gorgeously in order. Oh, it was the highest style, Zen taste, Japan, uh, they call it Yamato Damashi. And uh, we went into a little tea room, and Jano, in a kind of experimental fiddling way, pushed aside a screen. And inside was a Western-style room, completely cluttered with papers and old clothes and everything thrown in there, whoosh, you see, because everybody needs an unconscious place you can, somebody, everybody, everybody's house has a basement or a closet or something where they throw everything away. <laughs> That's just what I call the element of irreducible rascality. It's always there. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, on the outside, the place where you operate, you know, they have this sense of complete clearness, which is the Coincidence in one art expression of freedom and discipline. Anything goes because you've got complete space in which you can do anything, and yet the space is disciplined. Beautifully. Then in the subject matter of painting, Zen people, of course, as I said, prefer the secular. Even when they paint saints, sages, Buddhas, and so on, they give them a secular form. That is to say, they look like just ordinary people. They don't necessarily have halos or uh, special markings. They prefer that they shouldn't, that they should look kind of rustic. And they prefer to put on the altar, as it were, the, the, the um, tokonoma of a tea room, the alcove, in other words, is not almost never uh, adorned with a religious figure, but always with um, a naturalistic painting, rocks, water, vegetables, uh, trees, whatever. So in the same way in poetry, where the haiku is a kind of masterpiece of this way of feeling the universe, the haiku always celebrates a particular finite uh, G type, you know? G is distinct from Re. Instant of life. In the dense mist, what is being shouted between hill and boat? And you, from such a poem, will remember you know, some morning when you were at some gorgeous river estuary 
and you couldn't see anything. And there's a conversation going on between someone is calling down to someone in the boat from the hill, and you can't make out what it's all about any more than you can make out what's on the other side of the river, and yet you know it is gorgeous somehow. But the very fact that you can't see makes it all the better. This is all there is. The path comes to an end in the parsley. This is called in Japanese yugen. Y U G E N. We have no English word for yugen whatsoever. But you. Holzweger? <laughs> Trail ends nowhere, but with a certain implication. That is to say, um, as I was just trying to describe the place up in the mountain, where somehow the trail disappears, and um, there might be something beyond. But the whole point is that you don't investigate too closely. Because then you're the sort of person who, when you get in there, would spoil it. <laughs> it's like I say, um, when you make love to somebody, do it delicately. Don't be too inquisitive. Don't be too probing, because that would injure what you love. But the real uh, constant theme of the haiku is that it always incarnates the specific, finite, temporal, immediate moment. And with this, uh, says more than you can say with any amount of abstract generalizations. Only, 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 you always know that behind this, the people who make up the haiku are not bourgeois Philistines who say, Well, isn't the main thing simply to be practical and get on with your work? The point about the haiku is this. Uh, it's something in human life which is very difficult to pin down. But it's when somebody comes on at you and says something, but you know that there's another meaning behind it, which doesn't have to be stated between you. And so you get a joke. So you get a tacit understanding about something. <coughs> this looks like it's this, but it is that. <coughs> a haiku does this in a very cunning way. It's the simplest possible utterance. Basho said, to get haiku well written, ask a three-foot child to say, the robin's egg is blue. You light the fire. I'll show you something beautiful, a great big ball of snow. And this is a haiku. But something is conveyed by this, see, which um, we're not going to talk about. It would be bad form to begin with. It's 
like gentlemen in England don't talk about religion or sex. <laughs> uh, no, oh boy, you don't mention these things. It's not quite like that, but it's nearly like that. See, there's something got over to you by this. Where the whole fun of the thing is that you don't mention it. But this is possible only when you know uh, the Gigi Muge thing, that every bit of experience takes in everything else. So, in exactly the same way, we have a confraternity among us in our society today of uh, hipsters. And they can, with a flick of an eyelash, make a whole crowd of people laugh who are in the know. Because they have seen that one single mo motion of an eye is the whole universe in operation. And the joke is that the people outside don't know this. But when I move an eyelash at you and you're in the know about this, you laugh. It's a very funny game. <laughs>